So welcome to my video that is all about CIE, IGCSE, First Language English, Paper 1, Question 3, Extended Response. Um, so we are going to be looking at the new specification, which is 2020 onwards. Um, I have already got a video about this topic, if you care to watch that, but be aware that that is using the old specification. So some major changes with the new paper. Actually, question three is pretty much unchanged, uh, but the difference that you might find is that the text will be a little bit shorter and a little bit simpler, which of course we all love. Many of my students ask me what order they should do questions in. Of course, question three is worth the most marks compared to any other overall question. Um, and so often students will want to start with question three so that they've got enough time to finish it. My advice, if you are a strong student and you frequently get top marks, then maybe that could work for you. However, be aware that CIE have laid out the paper in a way to help you. Um, so you'll notice that question one, two and three, uh, they're all on the same theme. And so by the time that you've read all of the three texts and you've done all of the short answer questions and the language analysis, you'll probably have a much better understanding of the text so that by the time you come to write question three, which is the hardest, um, probably you might find that you do a little bit better. So it might be better actually just to try to manage your time, uh, do the questions in order, leave enough time for question three at the end, um, and that might work out for you. But if you are someone that struggles with time, that's something that you'll have to weigh up for yourself. So moving on. We're going to have a look firstly at some general advice and an overview, then we'll have a look at my writing advice and then finally we'll have a look at my reading advice. So beginning with general advice and overview. So on question three you could be asked to write any of these six text types, a letter, report, journal, speech, interview or article. Um, please keep in mind that when it says report that means a newspaper report and when it says article that means a magazine article. So typically you'll be asked to write about 250 to 350 words. What does that look like? Well it depends on the size of your handwriting but normally that looks like about two or three sides of paper. So you get marked on two criteria. So it's worth 25 marks and 15 of those marks come from reading. So the reading assessment objectives are these. Firstly, to demonstrate an understanding of explicit meanings. That means obvious meanings, things that the text clearly states happened. So do you understand the obvious events in the text? Next is about, can you understand the implicit meanings and attitudes? So if something's implicit, it's not obvious, it's not clearly stated, and it's something you have to kind of figure out and guess based on evidence on the text. So figuring out things like tone, emotions, um, and what might happen next. And then finally, can you analyse, evaluate and develop facts, ideas and opinions using appropriate support from the text? And that's really where we're looking at development. Um, so you're reading the text, you're understanding its implicit and explicit meaning, and you're using that to add on some of your own um, your own ideas, but it must be sensible, it must have appropriate support from the text. We'll talk more about that later. So then there are also 10 marks available for writing. So writing is basically SPAG, right? Spelling, punctuation and grammar, but it's also register and it's also structure. So can you articulate... Oh no, my laptop's running out of power. One second, will I uh, change location? Okay, so location change, let's carry on. Um, so the first thing that you're looking at is, can you articulate experiences and express what is thought, felt and imagined? So can you think about how the characters in the text feel? Can you kind of take on that voice of that character and imagine how they might have been feeling or what they were secretly thinking during that time? Uh, the second one is, can you organise and structure ideas and opinions for deliberate effect? So are you paragraphing? Are you paragraphing correctly? Are you doing all of this to try and get an emotional response from your reader? The third one is, are you using a range of vocabulary and sentence structures appropriate to context? So have you got um, some sophisticated, interesting vocabulary that the character in the text would use? 
are you using different sentence types or are you just kind of repetitively um, using the same sentence type over and over again? And not only that, but are these sentence types and is this vocabulary the type of language that the character you are trying to mimic would use? That brings me on to the fourth bullet point then, which is register your tone is appropriate to context. So if your character is a grandma, for example, um, she's not talking like a teenage boy. She's not saying noob and what's up and whatever else it is that teenage boys say these days. If your character is, by contrast, a geography teacher, a nice lady geography teacher, and she's swearing and being rude and talking about killing everyone in the school and there's no evidence for that in the text, then no, that's not an appropriate register. So does your language actually sound like who you want it to sound like? And then the fifth one is, is your spelling, punctuation and grammar accurate? How fluent is your writing? If your spelling, punctuation and grammar isn't perfect, it's not a super big deal. OK, you're never going to be able to get in the top one or two bands, uh, but all hope is not lost. Um, okay, so that brings me on now to writing advice. Now, I would like to emphasize before I start this that, as I've said, you're only getting 10 marks for your writing. Um, remember that this is a reading question. It's not really a writing question as much. It is on the reading paper after all. Um, so I would focus more heavily on reading and try not to get too freaked out by the writing because actually if you just try to sound like a newspaper or you try to sound like a, a letter, even if it's not particularly successful, if your spelling, punctuation and grammar is pretty good, your vocabulary is pretty good, you're going to get a decent mark. Um, but if you're focusing really heavily on the writing and not so much on the reading, you can drop those 15 points really, really quickly. I've seen students many times have a beautifully written letter, beautiful, absolutely perfect, flawlessly written, but they've not focused on the reading, they've got no relevant points, and so they've lost those 15 marks. So just keep in mind that this is a reading question. With that disclaimer done, let's have a look at our first text type. Oh no. <laughs> so general writing advice. So this goes for any type of writing that you have to do. Firstly, Think carefully about who is writing. So who is giving it? Read the question carefully. Often the person that is writing is a character in the text, but sometimes it is a journalist, a new character that isn't in the text, right? So think about who that person is and therefore what type of language would they use? What is their personality like? What type of vocabulary would they use? How do they feel about the incident uh, that's happened in the text? That would affect it too, right? Then next step, so you've got your character who's writing, but who are they writing for, right? It might be this granny, but if she's writing for children, that would sound very different than her writing to her best friend, Betty, who's 87. So who is the audience and how would that affect the writer's choice of language? So as I said here, a space captain writing a speech for his bosses would sound very different than a student writing a speech for school children. And even though both of these questions are asking you to write a speech, you can see that there's no clear advice, really. Uh, you need to think about audience and your writer. So no matter the text type, here is a general structure that you guys can use. Five paragraphs, nice and simple, short conclusion, short introduction, and equally sized uh, paragraphs for bullet point one, two, and three. Students often ask, well, can I mix up the bullet points? The answer is yes, yes you can. However, students rarely do this successfully and it's probably better for you if you just do a paragraph per bullet point so that you can very clearly visually see whether or not you've answered those bullet points and whether or not, if you have answered them, have you answered them equally and have you developed them equally? So I strongly recommend the five paragraph structure. So looking now at newspapers, um, and I'm going to look at newspaper and magazine headlines together just because they are quite similar and I think students often want to see like what is the difference between the two, it helps them to get a grip. So whenever you're writing a newspaper or a magazine, then you can give it a headline. A headline, remember, is just another word for a title. Now if you're feeling lazy, you could just copy the title of whatever text C is, um, or you can try to write your own. So some general advice about newspaper headlines then. Um, 
so newspaper headlines don't usually use names and are usually brief. Brief means short. So some examples, man saves cat from drowning, false fire alarm makes local school panic, and scientist goes back to 5000 BC. Notice that you don't need articles, so you don't need to use the word the, and you don't need to use the word a here. So it's not a man saves a cat from drowning or a false fire alarm makes the local school panic. We can remove those articles just to make it sound a little bit shorter, snappier. Um, and usually newspaper headlines are not emotional. They're just factual. Magazine headlines then by contrast can be more fun. Um, so you can use alliteration, you can use puns, you can use jokes, you can use emotional language, you can use exclamation marks and cultural references too. Um, so for example, um, the same one, but now a magazine headline, meow, man saves drowning kitty from certain death. So obviously we've got the meow, some alliteration and an exclamation mark or two. Um, and rather than saying kitty, uh, sorry, rather than saying cat, now we're saying kitty. Uh, so mao me, right? So that's far, far more informal. Next, again, same topic, false fire alarm sends local school, makes local school panic. Down here it's schools out, dot, 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 forever. How a false fire alarm almost sent Dulwich into meltdown. So here we've got a cultural reference. Perhaps you guys are too young to know the song School's Out for Summer, School's Out Forever. But it's a joke, it's a cultural reference. It's being funny, okay? It's funny. I said it's funny, so it is. Um, and we've got the use of ellipses um, and a little bit of emotional, humorous language. And then finally, again, for the same topic, Yabba Dabba Do, meet the real Fred Flintstone of 2019 AD. If you're in my U11 class, you'll already know that this is a reference to the famous cartoon, The Flintstones, uh, which is humorous because the topic is all about going back in time to caveman times. So we've got a cultural reference with Yabba Dabba Do. We've got all capital letters here. And it's just this fun, casual sort of topic. So you can be more funny, witty. You can use some alliteration. You can use some jokes and it can be more emotional. I think all of the ones that I've shown you here are quite humorous, uh, but the example that we're going to look at at the end of this lesson is all about penguins drowning. Um, so perhaps a good headline for that might be tragedy strikes penguins found dead on beach, something like that, right? So yes, it can be humorous, but it can also be emotional, a bit dramatic perhaps. And by looking at those two different types of headlines, that can kind of give you a hint about what the tone of the rest, um, the rest of the articles would be for newspaper versus magazines. Newspapers being more factual, less emotional, um, and magazines being more humorous and emotional. So newspaper articles then, this is the question that we'll have a look at. Um, so all of these questions that I'm looking at are referring to a November 2020 past paper um, and it's all about plastics and beaches. I'll, I'll, I'll put the, the actual past paper that we're doing down there, but as a summary, it's basically a guy goes to the beach um, and finds a bunch of penguins in an oil spill that are dead, lots of dead uh, penguins' bodies. And then eventually he finds one penguin that's still alive and tries to take it back to his apartment to kind of clean it up. So there's a bit of context. So for this newspaper article, it says, imagine you are a local journalist. This is what you'll see a hell of a lot on CIE for uh, newspapers and magazines. And notice whenever it does this, um, this is a common trick. You are a local journalist. You are not a character that you've read in the story. So remember that you're someone else. You're not someone that you've seen. Um, a common mistake that my students do is that they automatically write from the perspective of whoever the main character is, but you have not appeared in the text. Recent events have prompted you to write a newspaper article about the need to safeguard the area. Write the newspaper article. And so here's my example. No, it's that. Here's some examples of some newspapers. 
Um, so you can have a look and see that it is uh, saying Titanic sinking, no lives lost. We all know how that one actually turned out, but see, it's quite unemotional and uh, short, straight to the point. John Lennon shot dead, right? Horrible attack, but no emotion in the headline. Obama, Mr. President, Obama's historic victory, very unemotional, factual, short. Assassin kills Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson sworn in, unemotional, factual. So, some advice for writing newspaper articles then. Remember that the tone should be formal, unemotional and factual. The introduction should begin with a 5W paragraph, which we'll have a look at in just a second. That's the next slide, I believe. Remember, 5W stands for who, what, when, when, where and why. Um, you can quote witnesses if you want to, uh, so that could be someone that appears in the story. But if you do do that, make sure you keep it short and relevant to the question. Don't get off topic. And it's generally better not to use first person I, but you can use passive voice um, or quote some sources instead. If you're in the UK, um, then this would typically be more similar to a broadsheet newspaper like the slide that I just showed you. So a 5W paragraph, as I said, who, what, where, when and why. So here's an example. Yesterday, a local man, 36, was found dead in his house in Tameside. Police have not yet confirmed the cause of death, but sources believe that this may be murder. <laughs> so when? Yesterday. Who? A man. What? He was found dead. Where? In time, Tameside. Why? He was murdered. So it's basically like just give the reader all the facts in the first paragraph. Here are some useful phrases for writing newspaper articles. Sources state that, it is believed that, Andy Chen, 34, explained, abba, 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 abba. Uh, whistleblower re revealed that, um, locals hope that the situation can be resolved by blah, 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 doing something or other. And finally, what you've all been waiting for, here is my example. Tens of penguins dead after oil spill. Penguin Bay, located on the coast of Brighton, was the site of an oil spill last Saturday evening, resulting in the death of up to 40 penguins. Local sources state that the spill was caused by un an unregulated oil company, and this is one of many such incidents that have as yet gone unreported. The whistleblower, Tom Mitchell, 34, has spoken against the destruction to ocean life in Britain's last remaining penguins. So why don't we have a look at the writing of this then, why it's good. Um, so if we begin with the headline, you can see tens of penguins dead after oil spill. Notice no articles, um, so not after an oil spill, right? Very factual, no emotion, it's not suffocated, it's not murdered, it's not innocent penguins, it's just penguins dead, oil spill, right? Some facts. Um, then I've made up the place name. This is some development for your reading marks. Um, located on the coast of Brighton. Um, so here we have got our where. Let me just switch my pen over. So where. What. Death of 40 penguins. Who. Tom Mitchell. Who, what, when, where. Who, what, when. When and why? Because of that oil company. So we've got my five W's, but then take a close look at the way that it's written. Um, so when we are doing newspaper articles, it's best to give someone's full name. If the text doesn't have the person's full name, you can make it up, right? So give them a first name, give them a family name. Um, it just sounds better and it also gets you some marks for reading for development. It's also good to put the person's age in brackets. Again, you can make that up, no one expects you to know. If the text doesn't say the five W's, again, make it up. Keep it sensible, right? So don't have, you know, penguins dying in Australia or somewhere where penguins would never live, but you can make some stuff up. Um, notice that I'm not using any I, um, so I've got 
local sources state, so other people tell me, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I've got Tom Mitchell who's speaking out against blah, blah, blah. Um, so you can tell me what other people have said. You can also use passive voice and say, um, penguins dying on the beach has been reported. So use some passive voice like that. Um, what else? So we've got some quite formal language as well. Um, if we have a look at resulting, located, uh, site of, blah, blah, blah. Um, has yet gone unreported, the whistleblower, destruction. So we've got some quite formal language and some very good vocabulary here, of course. Um, so you can see that the tone is quite unemotional, though. Um, maybe in a second, once you see the magazine article, you can see that contrast there. So magazine article then, the task has largely remained unchanged. Every single magazine article that I've seen so far has made you the local journalist once again. So you're not Tom Mitchell, the guy in the text, you are a local journalist. Um, so now we're writing a magazine. So magazines in the UK, uh, they're quite informal. Don't forget CIE is in, is in the UK. So if you're not in the UK, it might be worth having a look at some British uh, magazine articles so you can have a look and see what CIE might expect. So magazine, ar magazine articles tend to be a little bit more informal. Actually, if you've studied tabloids, they're more similar to tabloids. So that kind of casual chatty sort of tone. Uh, so you can see here, shock, confession, oh my god, uh, Cheryl, I won a baby with Derek. Um, over here, Lisa's affair, shame, heartless, predatory marriage wrecker, very emotional language, uh, tension with husband, Kim's divorce turns toxic. So you can see it's a lot more um, informal and a lot more emotional in terms of the language. Of course, not all magazine articles are like this because you still have nice magazine articles like uh, the official magazine of Britain, an, an article all about a castle. Um, so have a think very carefully about quite how informal you want to take it. Usually CIE don't want you to be super, super informal because as examiners, they already know that students can write really informally. You don't need to prove that. You need to prove that you can write more formally. So I would call magazine article writing semi-formal, kind of formal. Um, think of a 40-year-old teacher who's, you know, they're sensible, but they've got a pretty good sense of humour. Think about that person, that teacher in your school, I'm sure that there is one, and try to write how you imagine that they would write. So it can be funny, it can be witty, depending on the topic. So you might want to, again, use some alliteration, some puns, and a bit of a chatty tone with your reader. But if the topic is more emotional and more serious, like the one that we're looking at today, then maybe it would be better to use some emotional, some emotive and dramatic language. Perhaps maybe it wouldn't be so funny. And as I've already said, this text type is more similar to a British tabloid. So here's an example. Death in Paradise. Penguin Bay is located on one of the most biodiverse and picturesque be beaches along the British coastlines. With stunning architecture and vibrantly coloured boats on the harbour, it is one of the country's most frequented travel destinations for the elite. The bay is packed with activities galore for those that can pay the price. The most popular attraction here being the adorable penguins. However, as I took a walk along this beautiful beach, I uncovered its dirtiest secret. The beach and wildlife here are victims of frequent oil spills. So um, we can see that it is indeed semi-formal because we've still got some formal language like biodiverse, picturesque, um, for the elite uh, attractions. Um, but there is also some slightly more informal language like referring to the dirtiest secret um, and also the use of the dot 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 is quite sort of like you're almost whispering on the side to your reader. Um, so you can see then that it is a little bit different to newspapers. We don't need to have the five W's. We can be a little bit more informal. We can be a little bit more emotional. Um, so some emotional language that you guys might spot the adorable penguins, um, and then the description of the architecture as stunning, 
um, and those kinds of little details, the beautiful beach down here, and also referring to uh, the wildlife as being victims. That's quite emotional, right? And you wouldn't normally expect that in a newspaper. In a newspaper. Now coming on to interviews. Um, so once again, we are a local journalist, but this time we are going to interview Tom. So whenever CIE gives you guys interviews, it will give you the three questions that the interviewer needs to ask. So it will literally list the three questions and you should just copy them. Don't change them. So usually you will have an interviewer and an interviewee. Your interviewee should do most of the talking. Um, so CIE give you those three questions and I actually recommend that you only use those three questions and don't add in extra questions. So from my experience with students and also from reading CIE's examiner reports, CIE doesn't actually really like it very much when you add in extra questions. And the reason is that you already don't have enough time in the exam. You've only got two hours to answer those three big questions. And so when students add in those extra questions, it's wasting time physically writing out the questions. Um, but not only that, it makes you lose focus because actually what CIE wants you to answer are the three questions that they gave you. So if you're not answering the three questions that they gave you and you're answering your own questions that you've made up, obviously you're going to lose focus on those reading points. Um, so although it can sound quite good and it makes the tone sound quite like appropriate for an interview, Actually, when students do it, they usually lose reading marks, so I recommend just don't do it. Just keep those three questions, don't add in any more. Some more writing advice is you can use some spoken language. Don't forget this is a conversation between two people, two people talking to each other, um, two people that haven't planned what they're going to say, so they need a bit of thinking time. Um, so you can say things like, well, and as you know, and ha, huh, I guess I hadn't thought about that. Or G. Um, and as I said down here, you can make it sound like a real conversation by using you. The two people are talking to each other, so of course they would say you. Um, so for example, they might say, you can't, re you can't really imagine, you can't even imagine, or don't look so surprised. Like in this example about the penguins, how might the interviewer react when they hear about the dead penguins? Maybe um, Tom would say something like, uh, wow, don't look so upset, or this happens every day, you should surely know that, or something like that. So how should you actually write it? Well, lay it out like a script. Here's an example. Daniel, so, Cathy, tell me why do you love EFL so much? Ah, <laughs> Cathy has become Michael, never mind. Michael, well, because of Miss O'Rourke, of course. So we've got some thinking words, so um, they're talking to the person, so they're using the word you. Again, another thinking word, and when people talk, they get excited, so we can use an exclamation mark to show that. Tip, if the text doesn't give the characters full names, create them. You won't have been given a name for your interviewer, make one up. It makes it sound more realistic, and you also get marks for development, so it's win-win. So here is my example. I've given my interviewer the name of Patricia Smith. I've made that up. Um, Patricia Smith, what are the attractions of the local area and why do people visit? So I've just copied that from CIE. I've not changed it. Don't waste any time. Just get on with it. Tom Mitchell, well, of course, you must have heard that Penguin Bay is famous for its simply stunning views, boating trips and, above all, the penguins. Smiles wistfully. Indeed, when I first arrived, I was quite touched by the varied wildlife, from fish to birds. Nature at its best, don't you agree? I never expected. <clears throat> Clears his throat as tears fill his eyes. <clears throat> I never did expect to see those beautiful birds, dead, suffocated by oil, and at the hands of unregulated and evil businesses. So probably you've already noticed one thing, which is, you can give stage directions. It sounds great, right? And it adds some development because it shows that you're thinking about how the character's feeling. So feel free to add some stage directions. Don't do it too much though, otherwise it sounds kind of weird. The second thing is we've got our thinking words. Well, here 
he's thinking, I never expected, and then he repeats himself, I never did expect. Um, under the thinking word with indeed. Also, he is talking to the interviewer, don't you agree? He's also using some exclamation marks and ellipses, using that punctuation that makes it sound like someone's speaking. So you might have noticed that now I've got a costume change, it is the next day. Moving on to speeches. So now the task is, imagine that you are Tom Mitch Mitchell. Recent events have prompted you to give a speech to locals about the need to better safeguard the area. So the question is still very similar. Um, you are Tom Mitchell again, so you are the main character in the text that we've read. But notice the audience, you're giving a speech to local people. Um, so that is a slight difference to the previous tasks that we've seen. Have a think about how Tom Mitchell would talk to a group of local people, we're guessing local adults, um, what level of formality it might be. Some general advice about speech writing. So when you're doing the speech, you are talking to a crowd of people, right? You're not giving it to yourself, you're giving it to other people. And so when you talk to other people, I hope that you are referring to them, right? You're not ignoring them, it's not a monologue. So therefore you will be using collective pronouns, um, words like us, we and our, as well as personal pronouns, you and your, to show that you are talking to a crowd of people. So you can say phrases like, we're standing here today to discuss, and I'm sure you all know that, blah, blah, blah. Especially for this task, um, because Tom is talking to local people about their local area, so I'm sure you all know blah, blah, blah is a very useful phrase there. Um, and then just like interviews, you should still be using language from spoken speech. Um, so phrases like, well, so, thinking words. Um, and then, as I've already said, the level of formality, well, that depends on your audience. So if Tom was talking to school children or astronauts or teachers or local people or environmental activists, clearly the level of formality and his choice of language would change and be different. So think really carefully about who is talking and who they are talking to. My example then. My fellow nature lovers, we all know why we are here today, standing on our beloved Penguin Bay, where just one week ago, the dead bodies of 42 innocent penguins were found smothered by oil. This place I have loved and grown up in is now at risk of being utterly destroyed by big business, greedy oil companies who care more about profit than our lives, than the lives of our wildlife. This is not why tourists visit our beautiful town. They come here to see the stunning views, to take idyllic boat rides with their families, to take a break from the harsh world outside. So probably you've already noticed um, my use of pronouns. So I am using some collective pronouns like we um, and also our. The Penguin Bay belongs to the audience and it belongs to Tom equally. Um, and I am also using, I think I used you somewhere. No, perhaps not. Maybe I just use we to show that he's on their side. Um, if you also take a look at the language. Now, because he's talking to a group of locals, I thought it might be quite nice to keep it a little bit more formal. Um, in my mind, I thought it was a bit more of a political sort of speech. He's trying to talk to them about um, like this disastrous thing that's happened and persuade them how bad it is and call them to action. So I'm trying to be quite emotive, but still formal. So, or semi-formal, you might want to say. So some of my emotive language, we've got innocent, beloved, that the penguins were smothered by oil, the fact that he's grown up in the place and it's at risk of being destroyed by greedy oil companies who care more about profit than our lives. Um, and then contrasting all of this negative language with some beautiful language to show what the big businesses are actually destroying. So we've got the beautiful town, the stunning views, the idyllic boat rides. Um, so we've got a little bit of a contrast there in language. So really have a think, um, and I recommend that you have a look at some political speeches by some famous politicians to help inspire you for speech writing. 
usually it isn't so much persuasive speeches that they have you write, but just kind of informative speeches. Like I've seen before, um, I think it was a speech where the, the space one, where the guy has to give a speech to um, his bosses about something that's gone wrong. Um, sometimes I think they phrase it as a talk rather than a speech. Um, but I think the same thing holds true in terms of pronouns, some spoken language, um, and you can be a little bit more emotional. Journal then. So here is our task. Imagine you are Tom Mitchell. So once again, we are Tom. Recent events have prompted you to write a journal entry about your experiences. Write your journal. Um, so when you're writing a diary, my recommendation is you begin the test by writing Dear Diary. Uh, that will help to focus you on the text type and it's also just um, a convention of diary writing in the west that we often begin with dear diary some people like Anne frank like to give their diary a name i think she called her diary kitty but i don't recommend that you do that simply because cie might get confused and think ah oh, this person thinks that they're writing a letter and not a diary so just be careful with that dear diary i think is a very good start the tone then well you can be more informal and more personal why Who's your audience? Well, you hope that the audience for your diary is you, just you yourself and that no one else will ever read it. And so therefore you can be more confessional. You can tell secrets. You can say things that perhaps the character would never admit to someone else. So the tone should be more casual, although of course this depends on your character. If the character in the story is very formal, then it wouldn't make sense for them to become super casual in their diary. So here are some useful phrases that you could say. I would never admit this to anyone, but blah, blah, blah. I secretly, secretly, I must say that I felt rather blah, blah, blah. And I try my best not to show how blah, blah, blah I felt. So it's kind of this sense of you're admitting something that you would never admit anywhere else. And also by talking about your feelings, often that will get you marks for development um, on this question. So it's win-win for both reading and writing for diary writing um, or journal writing, as CIE call it. Journal and diary are synonyms. So here's my example for diary writing. Dear diary, this week was supposed to be relaxing after my terrible breakup with Jessica. Just get my head down, do some work, move on. I thought the gorgeous scenery at Penguin Bay would help to make me feel happy, and for a while it did. The skies were clear blue, the coloured houses were so keech, I could even see happy penguins living in their natural habitat. habitat. Yet, yeah, on my fourth day in this magical place, I happened upon row after row of dead penguins smothered by oil. I couldn't control my emotions, and later had a cry about the destruction I had seen. So, um, you can see that I've done quite a lot of development, but it's not too long, right? It's just two sentences at the start, um, something that we don't get in the text, but why did Tom even go to this place? Um, so I did a little bit of development and made up about a breakup. Um, and another bit of like personal information, something we don't get in the text, but that you would get credited for development, is the fact that perhaps Tom cried about what he saw later. But that's also something that perhaps someone would only admit in a diary. I mean, if you cried, would you go and broadcast it to your friends and tell your friends, guess what? I cried yesterday because I saw some dead penguins. Probably not. Probably you'd leave that information out. Um, you can also notice that I'm using a lot of I because, of course, this story is all about you and you're writing to yourself. So it's going to be quite I focused. Now, in the text, there's no evidence that Tom is a very, very informal person, nor is there evidence that he's super formal. So I've kept the language kind of neutral. I'm guessing he might be maybe 30s and a journalist. So something around that sort of style. Um, so I'm not being very formal, nor am I being very, very informal. Um, I've got some nice descriptive language, like magical plays, happy penguins, um, but I'm not being like too flowery with my language. I'm not being too, too descriptive. Okay, and then the last text type is a letter. So now we are Tom Mitchell, but it's asking us to write a letter to a close friend about your experiences. 
Notice who the audience is with a letter very closely, perhaps more so with, than any other text type. A letter really requires you to think about who you're writing to. Often CIE will have it a close friend or a family member or something like that, but sometimes it might be a letter to your boss. Um, but if Tom is writing to his close friend, then probably he's going to be a lot more honest um, about his feelings and a lot more open. If he was reporting it to a local government member, maybe he'd be a lot more formal um, and a lot more persuasive too, because that person would have the power to change something. So think carefully about who the audience is. So some letter writing advice. Give the person that you are writing to a name. Um, would you ever write a letter to your friend and just start it, dear friend? I think that's weird, right? You would use their name. So make up a name, create a name. As I've already said, um, the audience depends on who you're writing to, the level of formality. So read that question formally, um, sorry, carefully. If the audience is a friend, then you can be more informal and you can talk about some shared memories and tell them the truth about how you felt. If the audience is a company or a boss, then in that case, you should be more formal. So in this case, we've got a letter to a friend. Now, my advice is that you create a relationship with your friend. You should try to make them seem like a real person that you have a real relationship with. So think about how you would actually talk to your friend. Um, you guys would have shared memories, things that you've both experienced, days out that you've had, friends in common, in jokes. And then also think about why are you writing to this friend about this topic? Why would you write to this person, right? Why not any other friend? So maybe your friend is super into penguins or wildlife, or maybe they're really into environmentalism, um, or maybe they were going to go on the trip with you. So think about the reason why you would even write to this person and why this person would care about what you've just read. And then finally, don't forget to sign off your letter by saying love, Sarah, kiss, 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 or best wishes, Miss O'Rourke. Um, so don't forget that sign off at the end. OK, here's an example letter. Dear Emily, I hope that everything is well with your mother now, and I'm so sad you couldn't join me on our planned trip to Penguin Bay. But you may be glad you didn't come after you read what, what I experienced there. It started out so well. Blue skies, boating trips and expensive accommodation. What more could a guy want? Penguin Bay's famous fishing harbour and natural wildlife did not disappoint. But on the fourth day, I made a horrific discovery. I don't want to upset you, but I can't sugarcoat this. Emily, I discovered rows of dead penguins. So firstly, notice I've given my friend a name. She's called Emily. And not only do I say it at the start, but I also repeat her name during the letter. It is a good idea to do this because it shows CIE that you are aware of your audience, but don't do it too much or it can start to sound really weird. If you begin every sentence with Emily, 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 then clearly that would start to feel quite uncomfortable. So why is he writing to this friend about this experience? Well, because they plan to go to Penguin Bay together right and so th therefore he's telling her about what he experienced i'm also getting a sense of what emily is like as a person because he says i don't want to upset you um, and that makes me think that maybe emily is quite a sensitive person and he knows that right um and also i'm showing the awareness that i'm tom as you can see i am a woman but i'm saying what more could a guy want because tom is a man um so these little references make it all seem a lot more real if you have a look at some of the punctuation, that's creating something of an informal tone, like I've got an exclamation mark here, a dash here, and some ellipses, that all makes it sound a little bit more spoken, a little bit more friendly, upbeat, um, and so on. And again, he's being relatively honest about his feelings. He's admitting that it was a horrific discovery um, and that perhaps and that he's sad that she didn't come and that perhaps she would be glad that she hadn't come after she hears what horrible things he's experienced. So he's being quite honest about his feelings with her. 
Okay, now let's have a look at some reading advice. So as I said at the start of the video, this is a reading question. Don't get too obsessed with the writing. Just try to make sure your spelling, punctuation and grammar is generally correct. You've got some interesting vocabulary. And then if you get the form basically right, then, you know, you can get a seven out of ten marks without too much effort. So reading advice. Now for CIE, you get reading marks for hitting these three points. So the first one is content points. Content points means the individual points of uh, the main events of the bullet point. So on the mark scheme, it will give maybe five or six different things that CIE expects you to hit. Um, so general overall topics um, that it would want you to talk about. Um, so these are the main points, similar to in summary writing, the main points that it wants you to hit. Unlike in summary writing though, um, CIE does like you to have some details for this question. Details are the extra bits of information related to the content points. They're about the same topic and add information. So that might be things like place names, locations, um, things that you did there, examples, um, like sometimes like food, for example, in one, it was about like the different types of drinks they had. So it's just some extra details to make your writing seem a little bit more realistic. And then finally is development. This is the one that students struggle with the most, but it's basically the extra ideas, your own imagination uh, that you add on to each content point. So your own creativity. Now, the important thing is that when you develop that there is evidence for it from the text. So it should be based on what you've read in the text. So if, for example, the text is like Miss Salmon, where we've got a nice, shy, anxious geography teacher, um, then if you have her suddenly turn into a gangster and burn down the school building, well, it doesn't really seem very relevant anymore and it doesn't seem like it's based on the text. So development should be linked to the text. Um, and not only this, but your development should be quick, brief, snappy. If you overdevelop and you start to tell a completely different story, you're not going to get the reading points. You're going to go off topic. So I usually recommend that development, even it could just be a clause in a sentence um, or just one or two sentences long. It shouldn't be too long and it shouldn't be the bulk of what you're writing or you're not going to score very highly. But it does need to be there if you wanted to get an A or an A star. So. It's that balance, really, of having some development, having it sound quite realistic, but not getting too carried away with it. So if we have a look at the mark scheme, you can probably see a little bit more what I mean. So this is the mark scheme for the first bullet point, which is attractions of the local area and why people visit it. So the content points are the bits in bold. So attractions of the local area and why people visit, a content point, it's a holiday destination, there's a small harbour, there are boats, there are views and scenery, and the wildlife. So that's what you get a content point for. Now the supporting details are things that it says in the text, but that aren't as important. So the luxury apartments, the fact that the west side is more fashionable, that the boats are fishing boats or pleasure crafts, that there are painted houses, blue sky and sea, um, and that there are penguins and shoals of fish. Now, CIE will suggest some development. Your development doesn't need to be the same as theirs. Um, but, you know, in the same sort of ballpark, if it's wildly different, you might start to question whether or not you've actually read the text very carefully. Um, so some example of some development that you could do. Um, about the luxury apartments, you could say it's very exclusive, it's high end, it's chic. Um, about the small harbour, you could say that it's sheltered, private, secluded, or that the atmosphere is peaceful. About the boats, you could say, think about what you could do on the boats, that you could go sightseeing, sailing, or on fishing trips. That's your imagination, right? And some development about the scenery. You could give a little bit more description. You could say how picturesque it is. You could say that Tom is really enjoying that different tone from being in the city or something like that. And for wildlife, you could develop that by saying that Tom really enjoys watching the fish swim in the harbour or that, I don't know, a seagull came and stole a chip from his lunch one day. So you're thinking about some extra little bits that you can add on. 
And notice that when you look at the development that I've highlighted there in green, it's not like crazy imaginative and, and it's not super long or developed. It's just about adding in these extra details from your imagination, showing that you're getting the idea of the text and you, you're understanding those implicit ideas that are in the stories that you've read. So now let's have a look at a really good response from a student. Um, so this is a response just for the first bullet point. I do recommend if you haven't already that you read the text first, which comes from November 2020. I'll try and put a link to the specific paper down in the box. So her headline, Quack, the famous penguin bay is out of penguins. Penguin Bay is located on one of the most biodiverse and picturesque beaches along the coastline. With stunning architecture and vibrantly coloured boats in a large harbour, it is one of the country's most one of the country's best holiday locations for the elite. The bay is packed with luxurious holiday apartments and summer houses for those that can pay the price. However, the biggest attractions here are the wild creatures. Large shoals of shimmery fish fill the ocean and penguins roam the land. It is also a great place for people that are interested in taking long leisurely walks or sightseeing. The large variety of fish has attracted many fishing boats as well. I found the scenery of the sky and sea to be heavenly. So let's start off then with our content points. So first of all, it's the fact that it is a holiday destination. Has she got that content point? Let's have a look. No, not quite. The next one is the fact that there is a harbour. So the harbour? Oh no, I meant to um, highlight, not scribble over it. Anyway, harbour. Um, about the boats and then the views, the fact that it's picturesque. So that is a view um, and the wildlife. Um, it's basically said when she talks about the fish and the penguins. So those there will be credited for content points. Now she has got lots of supporting details. So for example, she has got the fact that there are fishing boats. She has got, um, let's have a look about the holiday apartments and summer houses. Um, the specific types of wildlife, so the fish and the penguins, um, about the harbour that is fashionable, not quite, no. And then if we have a look at some of her development. So the development here is really good, that's why I picked this student's work. Um, so that is biodiverse. That is something that's not said in the text, but something that we could kind of um, extract from it reasonably um, about the architecture. Um, that the, the fact that it might be one of the country's best holiday locations it's not said in the text, but we could take that out. The fact that the holiday apartments are luxurious, um, but that it is only for the elite, for the very wealthy, for those that can pay the price. Um, the fact that you could take long walks or sightsee there. Um, and oh, also I forgot the details about the sky and the sea and the fact that they could be heavenly. So you can see that the development doesn't need to be super detailed. It can actually just be adding an adjective to a noun like biodiverse beaches. The biodiverse is getting you a credit for development. Um, and again, luxurious holiday apartments, it's just an adjective, but you're getting credited for it. You can see that it's not taking up too much of her writing. She's getting lots of different content points and development too. Um, so we're not getting long, long sentences of development and then very few content points, which is a common mistake that students make. <clears throat> Um, and you can see also that her development is very sensible. Um, so she's not adding in crazy wild ideas that there's no evidence for in the text. Um, so this is a really good example of how you could answer this question. So some overall tips then for reading. 
Um, so, number one, write about each bullet point equally. Now, as I said earlier in the video, I do recommend that you use that five paragraph structure with an intro, conclusion and one paragraph per bullet point. And that is so that you do write about the bullet points equally. The next one is do not repeat points. If you talk about the penguins once or you talk about the apartments once, don't mention them again. You're not achieving anything else by mentioning it again. You're just wasting time when you could be getting credited for other content points. The next thing is there are three bullet points in the question um, and I usually recommend to aim for about four or five individual points, in, um, individual pieces of information for each bullet point um, so that you can try and hit the mark scheme. Now you're not going to really know whether what you're saying is a content point or a detail. It doesn't really matter so much, just try and get the overall idea. If you're wanting to get a higher mark, um, then you should be aiming to develop your points, adding on your own imaginative detail. But do notice that any development should have evidence for it in the text. If there's no evidence, then you're going to lose some reading marks. Um, and then another piece of advice that I haven't actually said yet is that bullet point three, the third bullet point, will usually be implicit or based on your own opinion. So, for example, in this question, it's kind of, well, what did Tom do next after he got the penguin home? You don't know. It doesn't say it in the story. Um, in other questions, it's how can we stop X bad thing from happening? Again, you have to go back through the text and think what would be a logical thing to write. So don't freak out when you get to bullet point three. If you can't find too much evidence for it in the text, it is common that that usually comes just from your own imagination. Although what I am seeing more and more from the new spec is that half of it, there are some points that you could get from the text and the other half from your own from your own imagination. Um, but either way, just calm down when you see that. Don't panic that you can't find anything in the text and think logically about what could happen or what might happen. Um, so that is all of my advice for this question. Um, it is, I think, one of the most important questions because it's um, quite intimidating to have so many lines of empty paper that you need to write for. And also it is worth 25 marks. Um, once again, remember it is a reading question, so focus primarily on that. Um, and I hope that this video was useful. Goodbye.